Good morning, good morning, good morning. Today is Thursday, September 1st, 2022. We are in the final month of the third quarter and a month that typically is full of volatility and surprise. So what is it that you need to know, right? The bleed continues. More hawkish commentary out of another Fed head. And what exactly did Loretta say? We'll talk about that in a minute. Real rates need to go into positive territory. Oh boy. And talk of higher rates are sending the dollar up and commodities down. Treasury yields are up and the curve remains inverted. No surprise there. What are we having for dinner? For the Labor Day weekend, try the hot and sweet Italian sausages with peppers, onions, and mushrooms. It's always a fan favorite for a Labor Day barbecue. Okay, look, think about it this way. The lights go down, right? The music starts to play. The crowd readies itself. Enter stage left. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester. The stage is dark, and then bam, a single spotlight aimed directly at Retta. The music stops and then she drops the bomb, right? So if anyone was thinking that the Fed was gonna navigate a soft landing, you need to think about that again, because as I have been saying for a while now, soft and landing will never be used in the same sentence during my lifetime. Retta put it this way, Retta, right? That's what I'm, Loretta, Retta, kind of short name, right? Here she goes, and I quote, my current view is that it will be necessary to move the Fed funds rate up to be somewhat above 4% by early next year and then hold it there. I expect rates to remain elevated for some time. And then she nailed the coffin shut. I do not anticipate the Fed cutting Fed funds rates next year. Recall on Tuesday, Johnny Williams, New York, uh, New York Fed president, said that combating inflation would require lifting the Fed fund rates above 3.5% and then keeping it there through next year, the whole of next year. That means January to December of next year. So now we're talking 2024 already, Kavish. Anyway, taking her cue from both J.J. Powell and Johnny Williams, she invoked the for some time phrase, and then capped it off by saying that real rates will need to move into positive territory. So let's just unpack that just for one minute. Real rates equal Fed funds minus inflation. So currently real rates are negative, right? Because Fed funds are 2.5%, inflation is 8.5%, that means real rates are negative 6. So she said that real rates must move into positive territory. All right, so think. If inflation does not come down, then that means the Fed funds would have to go somewhere north of 8.5% in order to get real rates to be positive, no? Or if inflation comes down to, say, 6%, Fed funds would still have to be better than 6% to get real rates to be positive, right? You see where this is going? Unless they can get inflation to under 4%, then I just don't see how they can stop raising rates anytime soon, right? Can you? Because 4% seems to be the target on Fed funds rates. So if they get it below that, then it'll be positive. I keep saying it's not happening. But remember, I'm a baby boomer. I remember when inflation was 13% and Fed funds were 21%, leaving the real rate of interest at 8%. Kavish? And let me remind you, it was not pretty at all. Unemployment was 10%. And if you don't believe me, just ask anyone who was born before March 29, 1961. Okay, so what started out to be what many thought was going to be an up day yesterday quickly soured, and by the closing bell, the indexes were once again uh, in a pool of blood, right? The Dow lost 280 points or 9 tenths of a percent. The S&P closed uh, down at 39.55, down 32 points or, or 8 tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq lost 67 points or 6 tenths. The Russell gave back 12 points or 6 tenths of a percent. And the transports lost 145 points or 1 percent. And because it was the final trading day of August, we can look at how the indexes did for the month. The Dow, s and and NASDAQ all down by better than 4.5%, plus or minus. The Russell was the best performer, down 2.5%, uh, while the transports got slammed down 5.6% for the month. 10 of the 11 sectors ended lower. Basic materials down the most, 1.5%. Tech, consumer discretionary, energy, all fell about nine tenths of a percent. Industrials down eight tenths. Financials down seven tenths. Consumer staples and healthcare and utes all falling about six tenths, 
while real estate gained back four tenths of a percent. Communications, the XLC, uh, interestingly enough, was the only winner, and that gained two tenths of a percent. And that includes names like Facebook, Google, Netflix, Disney, Telephone, Comcast, and T-Mobile. The contra trades have had a field day over the last four days. The PSQ, SH, and DOG are all up leaving them up 23%, 15%, and 11% respectively year to date. Semiconductors continue to struggle as the SOX ETF lost 4%, taking that group down 31% year to date. And then after the bell, we learn that the U.S. government is now restricting future sales of chips that are used in uh, AI software for both China and Russia. So two names come to mind, NVIDIA and AMD, and both got slammed in trading after the bell. NVIDIA down another 5.5% on top of the loss of 2.5% suffered during the day, and AMD lost 3.7% on top of the 2.5% it lost during the day. To be clear, the move is intended to address the military risk, think China and Russia, that these chips present, right? That, that these chips are used in the military stuff. AMD came out and said that it was a non-event for them, while NVIDIA is trying to do a workaround. Convenient that Nancy and Paul Pelosi just sold all their NVIDIA days before she went to Taiwan and one month before the U.S. announced this new regulation. But I'm sure that's just a coincidence. There's nothing to see there. And speaking of Taiwan, last night they shut down an unidentified civilian Chinese drone. This after China increased the military exercises around the island after Nancy's visit there last month. This coupled with news that the U.S. is about to sell $1.1 billion worth of missiles and radar equipment to Taiwan. So I'm just saying, you can feel another storm is brewing in the Asia-Pacific region. But again, I'm sure it's nothing, right? nothing to worry about. Treasury yields rose. Prices continue to fall, all while the yield curve remains inverted. Do I need to say any more? Do I need to tell you what that means, an inverted yield curve now going on nearly 11 weeks? Oil, which was once again gotten slammed over the past week, is down again this morning. Recession worries, a stronger dollar, a new lockdown of 21 million people in Chengdu, China. Only adding to the hysteria over falling oil prices, all while crude inventories continue to fall around the world. Deteriorating economic conditions suggesting demand destruction is what traders are focused on. Just wait until the Saudis cut production to stop the bleed like they told us they were going to do. At 6 o'clock this morning, oil is down $1.25, trading at about $88.10 a barrel, taking it below all three trend line supports as it looks to find stability, probably now at the 85 level. Today is September 1st. It's a new month in the final month of the third quarter, and stocks are not feeling good. Futures this morning are pointing lower. Dow down 110. S&P's down 25. The Nasdaq down 120 uh, on the back of the NVIDIA and AMD story. That's not helping that index. And the Russell is losing 14 points. And here are just a few things to consider, right? It's continued hawkish commentary out of the Fed. Rising treasury yields that leave the curve inverted. A weakening global economy falling earnings estimates, threats of larger rate increases out of the ECB and the Bank of England, inflation around the world at 40-year highs with no relief in sight, a very contentious midterm U.S. election cycle, the Chengdu shutdown over new COVID cases, the U.S. government restrictions on chip sales to China and Russia, the shutdown of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline to Europe, the building geopolitical pressure between Taiwan, China, and the U.S., the break down of technical supports across all the indexes, sending the algos into a frenzy. Tomorrow's NFP report, the coming long weekend, the start of seasonally week time of year, trillions of dollars of new spending and billions of dollars of new taxes are all weighing on sentiment. Need I say any more? Now, while all this is true, it's not the end of the world though, right? It does require you to be a bit more dynamic and not so static. Expect the market to continue to chuck. Expect that we're going to retest the lows of June 3650-ish and hope that it holds. I think it will, but it may not. Remember what Morgan Stanley and Goldman are calling for lower lows on the S&P. In fact, 3,300 and 3,000 respectively before we find a bottom. I think that's a bit dramatic, but hey, what do I know? 
Monday, I indicated that the short-term trend line supported 39.96 was a key level to watch and it needed to hold. And if it didn't hold, then a test of the June low would be expected. And if that were to happen, that, that would be a 10% move lower in the S&P from where we are today. And while that's ugly, it is completely possible. Now, gold is on its way to testing $1,700 uh, an ounce, right? A level that I identified as held. Uh, it's down $12 this morning at $1,714 uh, $1, an ounce. Hawkish comments out of every Fed head helping to push the dollar higher is causing commodities to suffer. Remember the inverse relationship. And remember, it is the end of summer and volumes are lower. And that's causing exaggerated moves across a range of asset classes. The VIX is up 4.5% this morning, trading at 27. Still not enough to cause capitulation, but it is causing increased agita, right? And anxiety. Remember, 40 is the level that many believe will ignite capitulation. So just sit tight. Eco data today includes uh, uh, the S&P U.S. manufacturing PMI of 51.3, edging ever closer to the neutral line of 50 and then contractionary territory sub 50. ISM manufacturing PMI of 51.9, also edging closer. Construction spending expected to be down two tenths, challenging job cuts and total vehicle sales. And Friday brings us the non-farm payroll report. But remember, it's also the beginning of the long Labor Day weekend. Lots of empty desks leaving the algos in charge. And we know what happens when you leave the algos in charge. It's like leaving kids home alone over Christmas. European stocks are all lower this morning as the new month begins. It's all the same issues I noted above. Higher interest rates, a looming economic calamity, political and civil unrest, energy concerns, blah, 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 blah. The ECB is expected to raise rates by 75 basis points next week. They are way behind the curve. We've talked about that, something I've been pointing out for months. And leaders there expect inflation to remain elevated at least through the summer of 2023. At least through the summer of 2023. At 6.30, markets across the zone are all down better than one and a quarter percent across the zone. The S&P closed last night, like I said, at 39.55, down 31 points, leaving it flailing as it searches for a bottom. Yesterday, I told you that the chart suggested it could be three places, 39.55-ish, which was weak, 37.40-ish, which was weak again, and finally, the June lows at 36.65 which takes us back to the September, November timeframe of 2020. Well, we're at 39.55 and it looks like it ain't gonna hold, which leads us to consider what's next. Look, no one said this is gonna be easy, but you need to stay focused. Build a cash position as the market declines and be patient. If you own good, solid US mega cap names that are decent divvy payers, then sit tight. Sectors to be overweight, energy, healthcare, youths, and consumer staples all fit that bill. But you have to balance that with where you are in the life cycle. Younger, you want to take on more risk because you have more time. Older, you want to take on lower risk. It's just a math problem. Okay, so what are we having for dinner over Labor Day weekend? A great barbecue. This is a great dish. It's hot and sweet. Italian sausages with peppers, onions, and mushrooms, right? Now, considering that the market is giving us both hot and sweet, this seemed appropriate for me to uh, feature this particular recipe. It's simple to make, and it goes a long way. For this, you need one pound each of hot and one pound of sweet sausages, right? You need green, red, and yellow bell peppers sliced. You need garlic smashed. Uh, you need two large onions sliced. You need sliced mushrooms, olive oil, and salt and pepper. You want to spark up the grill and get it nice and hot. While that's getting hot, in a very large saute pan, you want to heat up the olive oil, Add in the smashed garlic, saute it around. Now add in the sliced onions, the sliced peppers, and the mushrooms, right? It's going to look really big. In the, it's going to be like a pile in the saute pan. Just keep the heat on medium, stir it. As they start to cook, they get soft, and they kind of melt down a little bit, right? Season it with salt and pepper. Cover it, but don't leave the cover. Put the cover a little bit off so the steam goes away, uh, and they'll cook nicely. Now put the sausages on the grill and cook them, making sure to turn them and cook them evenly, when they're done, now you can serve this a couple of ways. You can leave the sausages whole and serve them with the peppers, onions, and mushrooms like a submarine sandwich. Or you can slice the sausages into bite-sized pieces, mix it with the peppers, onions, and mushrooms, and serve it on a large platter, right? Make sure to have roasted potatoes and a large mixed salad to serve with this. It makes a great Labor Day barbecue dish on the table with everything else you're going to serve. Burgers, steaks, chicken, whatever else you're going to make. It's simple to make. 
and it goes a long way, and it's always a fan favorite. Look, the day is young. The sun is out. It doesn't look stormy, although we're supposed to get a storm this weekend. There are three storms supposedly building off the coast of Florida, so the jury's still out on whether or not we're going to get smacked in any event. I look forward to today. Until tomorrow, take good care.